Food Network hosts here in Canada and 100 countries around the world. I've written 11 cookbooks. And I've got two kids, three kids, and, a, uh, and two businesses. So, you know what I mean? So that's the stuff that matters. I'm, I'm here today to pretend that I understand business. And I've got all kinds of wild insight into what, what you can do to improve your lives, improve your businesses, and, and, and measured outcomes. Pretend. Because frankly, like, I think like everybody in this room, what we really have is extremely good 2020 hindsight. You know, so I can look back at all the screwed up things that I've done in my life, all the mistakes I've made over my career, the story, the path, I can look at every bit of it with clarity. But looking ahead, now that's a little tougher, isn't it? So I'm not gonna sit here and pretend that I'm some kind of business or hospitality guru, that I've got it all figured out and that really you just need to take a couple of top notes and you're gonna have it too. It doesn't work that way, does it? That's not how business works. However, I do know that my core values and who I am as a person and how I approach work and the people around me, I do know that those are things that have been with me forever and that those are values that I can share with you. And so, you know, I think back, and so much of this is defined by, by awards, eh? Like, you, you know, you, you win the award, you get the plaque, you get the diploma, and that's it, you're an expert. In fact, I found myself uh, standing on stage at Niagara College six years ago. I had gotten myself an honorary degree. They invited me to be the speaker and get the degree, which means the, the robe, the, the hat, the whole thing, standing next to the president of the university, on stage, thousand kids in front of me, facing their life, you know, here we go. And he's over here talking about me, and he's going on and on about Michael's life's work. And I'm thinking, that's an award? So, you know, I get a nice little diploma out of it, but my life's work? Like, it's over. That's it, it's done. Call it in, we can write it up, he's done. And I have to say, as a, as a, as a reward, as an award, I, I don't know, it didn't sit well with me. It really threw me off. And I remember being very excited, like, this is a big deal. I mean, who wouldn't? The first time in your life you get offered an honorary degree, like, that is something. That is a big deal. Very excited until I hear him going on and on about my life's work. Well, that threw me. It threw me into a bit of a tailspin. It got me thinking. Uh, thinking really hard about what is my life and where am I going and what do I want to do? And this is all about five, six, seven years ago. And it all it became pretty clear pretty quickly for me what I needed to do. And basically what I needed to do was just stick to, stick to my core values. Now, we may or may not see some nice pictures here in a few minutes. <laughs> and if we do, I'll, uh, nice. I'll explain it to you. Um, but, you know, maybe the, uh, maybe the first lesson out of all of this, as I like to say. Ladies and gentlemen, we grow up on that day when we stop giving a shit what the world thinks about us. When we stop caring what that guy or that person or that person thinks about you. That's called growing up. Now in my case, the very next day, I wake up craving authenticity. I'm 52 years old, folks. A lot of guys in my position are just kind of fading off into the sunset. They're done, they did their thing, their life's work is behind them. Not me, not me. And I know for me, if anything, it's become more about authenticity than ever before in my life. Time is too short. I just don't have it in me to get up in the morning and do something that I don't care about, that doesn't speak to me. Authenticity matters, folks. And you know what happens when you don't have it. You know this. So, okay, there's that big first lesson, authenticity. All right, I think I worked that out. Next up, so, so then what did I do? Well, we've had, I've, I've worn some very interesting hats in my life. I am tremendously blessed to have been a part of Food Network Canada when it launched. Obviously, it gave me some really interesting opportunities over the years. I'm tremendously thankful for that. I mean, just one show alone, my Chef Abroad series, traveling the world, 47 countries, five times around the globe. I mean, who would do that, eh? Like, wow, what an opportunity. Of course, it did take down my relationship with my son's mom for all time. That's gone. You know, so there's always that other side, eh? And I guess that's not why I'm here, though. I'm here today, again, because of authenticity, because of what happened next. Because five, six years ago, struggling, trying to figure it out, 
on this path, doing some really interesting things. I've had some uh, some amazing adventures, in particular with Sodexo, the company that's one of your sponsors here today, and a lot of my colleagues are here in the room, and we've done some amazing things together over the years, things I'm very proud of, things that are underlined by authenticity. But that's just a small part of what I do. And so I found myself casting around, and, and you know, my business at the time was wholly focused on food <laughs> media production, creating books, creating TV shows, web series, special events, et cetera, et cetera sometimes in venues that some of you folks represent. Yet th there was something missing. And so we commissioned the big business study. We hired the consultants to come in and tell us what we already know. Pay a lot of money to learn what we already knew. We need to do something, they call it, this is, this is how they make it seem like it's worth thousands of dollars. They don't just say to you, why don't you open a store? They say, you need bricks and mortar. <laughs> bricks and mortar, huh? bricks and mortar, okay, I guess that means like a building. All right, I get it, bricks and mortar. So we started thinking to ourselves, I say we, my company, my team, the folks around me, my wife and I, we started thinking, well, what do we want to do? Where's this gonna go? And we, we started, uh, you know, I've got this passion for cooking with fire, and we had this offer in on this amazing land near us, had this sort of idea growing for this outdoor fire thing, festival every day sort of thing. I had no idea what it was gonna be yet, but so what, I still had an offer on the land. Now that may seem backwards to you, but that's how I roll. Like I'm not one of these guys that spends all my time, you know, years and years of planning before you make one small move. Like, forget it, that's so paralyzing. You know, and if anything, in enterprise, that can often really slow down the works. Now, I understand the need for, for people to report to other people and systems and all of that. I'm not, uh, not saying you know, shouldn't do that, but boy, I can tell you as an entrepreneur, as a guy who makes my own choices, you know, uh, go with your gut, trust your gut. And so, hey, yeah, we're ready to spend a million bucks on this piece of land and we have no idea what we're gonna do with it yet. And then, everything changed. This is about trusting your gut. Gentlemen uh, that I used to work for, who owned the restaurant that I worked for in the 90s, the Inn at Bay Fortune, where I started my career as a chef. There it is right behind me. Hey, look, pictures! <laughs> yes, so, so there we are, uh, sitting in my living room, David Wilmer, okay, let's see what the next picture is. Yeah, we'll leave it there. It's <laughs> so this guy is sitting in my living room. He owns the Inn at Bay Fortune, the place that I had worked at all those years ago. I started my career as a chef there. I grew up as a chef there. I learned what it is to be a chef, to have a culinary voice, to be a part of a, of a culture creating its own culinary identity. 30 years ago on Prince Edward Island, there was no food culture there. You know, when I arrived on the island, everybody told me the best restaurant was this Italian restaurant. And I thought, what, 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 how could that be? It just didn't make sense. Flash forward to today, we are one of the world's most authentic culinary cuisine destinations. We're overrun with tourists looking for real authentic food. And we've got it, we've got the goods. So. Flashing forward, now I'm sitting in my own living room. The owner of the business is sitting in the living room with me. I haven't been a part of the thing for 17 years. It's just up the road from where we live, and he's begging me to buy him out. And I'm thinking, why? You know, why? Like, yeah, I've done that. Look at this other business idea of brewing. You know, and then we realized, holy cow, for the cost of the land over here, I can buy more land here with buildings, with momentum, with cash flow, with my own goodwill, it didn't take too long to figure out, maybe we should really look hard at this thing. So we did. We did due diligence, the consultants would say. <laughs> and so I spent the winter, I live, as I said, just literally seconds, just, just up the road from this place, out in the country. And I'm an outdoors guy, I spend lots of time outside every single day, I'm on the land every day, no matter where I am. And so walking around that winter, hiking around, trekking around that property, thinking it through, thinking it through, before we make an offer, what can we do here? What can we do? How's this gonna work? And the first couple of ideas were pretty straightforward. Now the first one was, let's, let's grow what we serve. Let's, let's grow, okay, let's get a farm going. I got 48 acres of land. Let's grow what we serve. Let's grow every single thing we serve. That is an audacious goal. Folks, that doesn't make sense. Like, you know this, a lot of us here are food service operators. You get into the numbers, so where do you hold the cost of the farmer? Is that labor, or is that food cost? <laughs> what? 
<laughs> you know, and, and are you going to save some money growing your own food? Hell no. <laughs> <laughs> but we do it. We do it. And that was an easy idea. That's what we serve. And the second big idea was pretty easy, too. You know, if you had asked me, for 25 years, any food media who asked me, hey, what's your favorite meal? What do you really like to cook? I would always say, gentlemen, get a fire going in the backyard. You know, get that down to some nice hot coals, cook some steaks, get your buddies, get some beers. That, to me, is the best meal possible. But largely because that's also about who's there, not just what's on that table. Who's at that table matters. So, fire, fire, it's part of me. Yeah, let's cook with like let's cook with live fire. In fact, let's do it all. I think I got pictures now. <laughs> all right, there's the end. It is a fortune. Okay. Oh my delicious, gorgeous wife. She's <laughs> and here we are. Okay, so uh, this is the end. Forty-eight acres. There's the farm. Four greenhouses. It's on the hook. You're not here to hear about farming today. Uh, you are here to hear about why we did this. Uh, my chef's team. My farmer there. Um, and fire. We cook with fire. It's all my fire. But why am I telling you this story? Because it's the last part that is the most compelling, that I think is a takeaway for today. I mean, who wouldn't go to a restaurant that grows what they serve? Yeah, that sounds great. It, and they cook with fire, yay! The last idea was, this, was the, the toughest, folks, because the last idea is what I call a feast. We're not a restaurant. We're actually more of a banquet house than we are a restaurant. Our guests arrive at 5 o'clock in the afternoon and take a one-hour farm tour, walk the entire farm with the farmer. Then at 6 o'clock, we start Oyster Hour. Oyster Hour is outside. Oyster Hour is in our fire garden. Oyster Hour is all kinds of crazy that you can do when you're not worried about the fire inspector and the HVAC and the engine system inside. <laughs> so here we are out back doing all this crazy. And then at 7 o'clock, we have a toast at our flight poles. And then we all go in, and we sit down together, and we eat a seven-course meal together, and we all eat the exact same thing. That's a banquet house. It's amazing. But what's really interesting is that we do that at long, shared communal tables. Butcher block tables overlooking Bay Fortune. Let's see, I've got pictures of tables. Let's see. Yeah, not really. There's one. There's a table. <laughs> as simple as that may seem, that was a game changer. And everybody around me was scared to death of it. And frankly, so was I. Because I've never in all my life have I seen a restaurant that does these three things in one place. That you've all seen places to do some of these things, but putting them all together, an hour's drive from the nearest town, airport, insanity. Nobody believed it would work. The feet shoulder to shoulder with strangers? What are you talking? You can't do that today. But I stuck to my gut. I trusted myself, and we went for it. And it didn't help. When mid-April, when we finally signed the deal, lots of due diligence, signed the deal. I think I had to sign like 37 times that day to buy the joint. God, it's crazy. So we buy it, then local newspapers catch hold of it, they print a front page story that Michael and Chaz have bought the NFA fortune. They return to his roots and they're gonna have a farm and it's all gonna be fire and they're gonna sit strangers next to strangers <laughs> at long tables. That morning, we got a phone call. 10 o'clock that morning, I got a phone call. I knew who she was. She'd been dining at the end years ago when I was there, way back when. She reminded us of how important it was to her family and her family's traditions and their celebrations and she assured me that she would never be back because we're ruining it shoulder to shoulder with strangers. What? And so I didn't sleep a lot. That's five years ago. Flash forward, get the doors open. We're late, of course. Anybody ever start to late? Get the doors open. Within two days, I'm sleeping like a baby. I could see the very first night this works. And why does it work? And again, back to 2020 hindsight, because now I get it. I watched this for five years. I totally get this now. Ladies and gentlemen, we are human beings. We can't fight it. And human beings, since the dawn of time, have come together around food. It's in us. It is part of our genetic makeup. It's in our DNA. 
this need to be social, to come together with other people around food. I've said it for years. I don't give a damn what's on the table. I care who's at the table. And I'm saying this to you because my God, I am one of these guys. I know how lucky I am to cook for my family. I get it. I'm very fortunate. I have the time to do it, the resources to do it. I got a hell of a kitchen, you know, a nice garden. I cook for my family. But more importantly, my family sits down together at the dinner table each and every single day, period. Whether daddy's home or not. Last night, they were sitting there having tacos. You know, this is so essential. This is so important in this day and age of ours. We, too many of us, have convinced ourselves that we're too busy being busy to do the things that basic human beings do. We sit down together and we eat food together. That's it. And I see it every single night what happens in this restaurant. Every night I see it. I see people come in, they walk into the dining room, and you can see the fear in their eyes right away. They didn't get the memo. Whoa, 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 what's my thing? What's this? You know, they're freaked out. And they sit down. Within a course or two, the sun is shining again. Like, it's very straightforward. We are human beings. We want to be with other human beings, especially around food. And so as, as event planners, as venue managers, and folks in this industry of ours, I would strongly suggest to you, look for ways to put people together around big tables. Move on past this, these giant round tables where I can't even talk to you over there. I don't even know who you are at the end of a meal. It really bugs me. We've got to do better as an industry. And lots of us do, of course. I mean, there's lots of great practices. I'll share with you some of my own once I check my notes. <laughs> so, trust your gut. Trust your gut. That's what that story is all about. Trust your gut. It's pretty straightforward. Um, here's another one. And I'm kind of all over the map here. Not particularly, it doesn't need to be a straight line. But I strongly believe that we all need to stand up for something. Stand up for something. I don't care what it is. Stand up for something. Be passionate. Have a backbone about something. Now, that's a double-edged sword. The simple fact is, I, okay, how do I say this? So when I first started doing all this Food Network stuff, you know, and they started to write about the shows, and the shows did really well, you know, there's a lot of folks saying, oh, he's Canada's best chef. No, I'm not Canada's best chef. I might be Canada's tallest chef, but I'm not Canada's best chef. But I've never been Canada's best chef. Maybe best known chef, maybe. Uh, okay, put me on the list, but not best. I mean, that's a big word. You know, the other one that really bugs me is I, I, I loathe being called a celebrity chef. Please don't call me. That, that's, that, that's, a, that's a bunch of <laughs> Work that you know, I go to culinary schools, and the first thing the kids want to ask you is, okay, so how do I get a show on Food Network? I go, do it the way I get it. Work for me. 17 years in the trenches. 16 hour a day, seven days a week, no family life. And then I saw a camera. 17 years. I'm a working chef, okay? And so when I say stand up for something, I went through that time. But I'm wondering, why are they calling me this? And what am I supposed to do? And you know, you've heard of this imposter syndrome. You're like in the back of my head, I'm like, oh, boy, somebody's got to discover I shouldn't be here. What's up? <laughs> and, I, and I question, what am I supposed to do with this? Why do I have this opportunity? And at the same time, my son was born, 17 years old now. And that's when I discovered our food system is screwed up. <laughs> we have a lot of problems in North America's food system. Yes, we do. And so I took that opportunity to take that podium and stand up and yell at the top of my voice and try to serve as an example for good, healthy food, for healthy food lifestyles and families, et cetera, et cetera. I can say this to you now because at the time, new, raw, I didn't really understand what I was doing. I'm looking back with 2020 hindsight, though, and I understand that we go, all of us, we go through a phase in life where we haven't quite figured out what we stand for, but we still stand up, and we still yell at the top of our voices. We all know people like this, and generally where we are is on one end of the spectrum, and all we're really doing is massaging our own egos, and nothing's really happening. We're just over here or over here, we're yelling, making a lot of noise. And I can say this because I did that. I did it. 
I stood on stage a lot and talked about very poor food habits and our broken food system and all of those things. And I called out a lot of people for a lot of very poor practices. Am I proud of that? Yes and no. But I understand that there also comes a point in life where we grow up and we realize we've got to do something. And it's not good enough to just talk. Talk is bullshit. Action is what matters. And so I put my money where my mouth is, and I started to do it. You know, I could, I could cite 20 examples of this. Food Network telling me, no way can you have a healthy cooking show. Nope, not going to happen. You're not allowed. Can't do it. Not going to work. No healthy cooking show. Nope. So I did it anyway. <laughs> going to chef at home. It was about, you know, just going in the fridge, making it up. But it was still healthy. 99% of that show was healthy, <coughs> plant-based, lots and lots of real, real cooking. You know, another example, just standing up for something, this business of mine. You know, after all these years of talking about organic farming and all these methods and transitioning and taking care of the environment and sustainable practices and ethically sourced meat and all of these things that I've been talking about for all these years, finally a chance to do every single one of those things in one place. Boy, does it ever feel good. Stand up for something. Have some values underneath what you do, what you believe in, what you're passionate about. Have a value system. Take what it is, stand up for it. Understand that it'll evolve over time. It's worked for me. It has worked for me. Because now, all of that momentum, understanding that, yeah, okay, we have a broken food system. But we also understand one of the biggest contributing factors to that is your disconnect to where your food comes from. Even in industry, we're disconnected from where our food is from. We don't see people. We see phone numbers and boxes and Cisco GFS trucks and that sort of thing, but we don't see the people. We're disconnected from the people that produce that food. And so that's what I'm fixing with my business. Now, am I gonna change the world? No. Am I gonna somehow magically fix an entire industry? No. But that's my point. There comes a point when you realize, stop talking, start doing, and watch what happens. And so it's rippling. It's, the business is incredibly successful. It's getting bigger and bigger. More and more people come in. Our numbers, our profitability, everything about the business is working just fine. And we're connecting people daily to their food. And it's working. And they're really into it. And you can see it in their eyes. You can feel it in their voice and their passion. They're coming an hour early. Rain or shine. They never missed the farm tour. We started it last year. I said, hey, let's do a farm tour. Half the guests will come, probably. Not half, probably. They all come. 80 people in the rain, 5 o'clock in the afternoon, traipsing around my farm, trying to learn where this food comes from. Stand up for something. You know, it really works. OK, back to the notes. <laughs> all right. Um, here's another interesting one. I think, as adults, for some reason, somewhere along the way as adults, we lose the ability to play. We need to be invited to play. Now, you can pick that apart a bit. Some of us have hobbies, sports, things like that. But in general terms, we take ourselves a little too seriously. We need permission given to us to play. Now, again, 2020 hindsight. This wasn't me graduating from cooking school 30 years ago and saying, okay, so, oh yeah, I don't need permission to play. I'm gonna build a career on that. It's not how it worked, but I did it anyway. All through my career, everything I've done, inadvertently, and very, very deliberately now, it is about interactivity. It is about engaging people. Getting them out of their seats and engaging. Not just putting rubber chicken in front of them, but getting them up. Let's do something together. Good example. Anybody who watched that Chef at Home show all those years, go in the fridge, open the fridge, see what you can find, make it with this. If you don't have that, use this. Uh, 11 cookbooks. Seven of them, the very best sellers in the country the years they were published. All of those books, asking you as cooks, make a choice, get engaged, use your favorite hot sauce. If you have this, use this. If you don't have this, you can use this. Get engaged. 
I do, uh, I, I, my company and I are asking all the pond to do special events all over the country. They cater dinners constantly for conventions, things like that. And we have what we call our interactive dinner party. So guys like me, you know, the Lynn Crawfords, Chuck Hughes, Michael Smiths of the world, we're often called upon to come and host a meal for a group or an event or the like. And our approach, I send a team in, my team, we go in, we cook the food. We don't just call it in, hey, recipes, pick it out of the books. I'm not calling out names, and Lynn and Chuck are two awesome people. They're not the ones doing this, but there are a lot out there that don't pay any attention. The venue just picks the recipes out of a book, and that's enough. My team goes in and bands. We cook the food ourselves. But what's most engaging is the way we have built these interactive dinner parties. So you've seen this a million times. You've got eight people sitting at a table. You're doing the event. They're all there you know, to get dressed up or hang out with their wife or whatever, but not really connected to the cause or whatever the event happens to be. And it can often be extremely boring, these events. You know this. So for me, it started with this simple little play years ago um, that I actually picked up from a colleague of mine in Sodexo where we would simply put Play-Doh on the table, okay? Eight people, eight cans of Play-Doh, eight different colors. Okay, folks, let's make a sculpture all together, come together as a team, there's a theme, it's, uh, it's food tonight, that's the theme, make a food sculpture, break the ice. We did it, and it worked. And from that simple little idea grew this entire interactive dinner party where we basically, we have a tent top, we set eight people at a tent top, we have a landing zone at that table, and every single person at that table at some point in the night has to get up and do a job. They start the evening with a yellow envelope in the middle of the table, they open it up, it has eight name tags on it, they have no idea what those name tags mean, but they have to put one on. Picasso, paparazzi, beefcake, Slowest coat, fastest coat, worst coat, best coat, dishwasher. Oh, they always fight over that one. <laughs> and then gradually over the night, I call upon those people to do their job. Bartenders, get up, let's go, we leave the room. Out we go, we go to a separate breakout room, I give them a kit, I show them how to make the cocktail, they go back to that big landing zone on their table, the glasses are waiting, they make the cocktail. They, and it is so entertaining so on and so forth. The paparazzi's job is to document for Instagram or Twitter or TweetBeam or whatever the hashtags of the night are. On and on and on. I get beef cakes on the stage shaking cream to make the butter that we forgot to put on the table with the rolls. On and on and on. What I mean by all of this is we have built an incredible business around these interactive dinner parties. They kill, they crush, like there is nothing like this in the market today. And it's all because we clearly see adults need permission to play. Everybody got it? Oh yeah, we do that in my business every day. For instance, uh, when the salad course comes, <clears throat> we look around, and if there's a kid coming for dinner that night, and you know, oh, I wanna go out and be a chef or somebody like that, they're off today. That kid gets out of their seat and they make the salad dressing for the entire restaurant that night. We do it every single night. Now, we have a system, so they don't screw it up. <laughs> but, but they do, they get that sensation. You know, our oyster shucking, for instance. We shucked well over 40,000 oysters last year. Slurp all you like, we don't keep score. It's the only oyster bar you're ever gonna go to where we're encouraging you to have more, more, go. We teach you how to shuck those oysters, too. Anybody who says anything that remotely sounds like they'd like to learn how, boom, you wanna learn how to We show them how, we teach them right there on the spot. Gotta get those folks out of themselves. Gotta get them enjoying themselves. Got to give them permission to play. In our oyster bar, it says right on the menu. You know, local oysters, sassy, shucky. It's an oyster bar. They're supposed to be vaguely R-rated in an oyster bar. And they got to get appropriate, but you know, it's an oyster bar. And so when, uh, when we got all these people in front of us, they're all lining up for their oysters, generally they're 10th or 12th, and there's the one person at the back of the room, and you can just tell, we can tell, we know. Oh, who's the virgin? You, front and center, let's go. Everybody, part the waves. Virgins get to go first. And we have this giant ceremony. And we talk them through it, and we teach them. And, and when they finally slurp it and suck it and chew it down, we'd have this giant brass ship's bell, we'd ring all hell up. 
And we have a card that we give them shaped like an oyster. <laughs> you got chucked in at the end of a fortune. <laughs> Adults need permission to play. And when you give them that permission, they love you for it. We all want to play. We're just too worried about what the guy and the girl next to us is thinking. So when the other guy, the host, sort of imposes it on you, <clears throat> well, yeah, come marching in and everybody has a great time. Adults need permission to play. Everybody got it? Yes. Okay, make a business around that. It's working for me. <laughs> Here's another one. Don't compromise. Hey, look, you know, we all have our value systems. We all have our the things that make us tick, the ways that we do business, the way that we lead teams, the way we inspire people around us. We all have those ways of doing things. And often, when we're when we move jobs or move into a new project, sometimes we check some of those values at the door because we allow the definition of the project, the project itself becomes a surrogate for us. We allow the project to define us instead of the other way around. A good example of this, uh, with Sodexo, going back 10 years ago, we were asked to cater the Olympics in Whistler, in, in Vancouver. We catered the, uh, the two athletes' villages, one in Vancouver, one in Whistler. Not the public, just we fed the athletes. And I was asked to lead the team in Whistler. And what a time we had. Greatest single professional challenge of my life, by far. You know, when I got home after the whole thing was over and I did the math, we were doing 15,000 meals a day. A day? I did the math, I added it all up, and that six weeks I had served more food in six weeks than in my entire career put together. It was a big deal. And what I discovered, having never done anything like this this big before, first being in a, being in a, in a hierarchy, having a boss, and the boss had a boss, that was new to me. You know, I'm an entrepreneur, I own my own businesses, I do my own thing. That was interesting, learning how to deal with that respectfully. Uh, and then leading a team of 100 chefs. I've never done that before. How do you do that? Well, as it turns out, you stick to your guns. Don't lose your value system. And that's all I had, so I did what I knew. I led the team. And it worked. And you know, one of the things that we had to do was constantly deal with special requests. These are athletes, right? They're, we're in Canada. We're hosting the world's athletes. Like, we had to do a good job. They can get whatever they want. They're Olympic athletes. They get what they want. You know, we had the, the figure skaters that would come up and they'd get the two shrimp on the spinach leaf with the cranberry on top. You know, the figure skaters. And then the bobsled boys would come and they'd get the 50 shrimp, you know, with the four steaks and the chicken special and the pasta and then a pizza for dessert. You know, very different. And special requests, you know, of course. And we would meet with the teams and we'd say, look, whatever you need, just let us know. I'm the chef. I'm here for you. Let us know. And would you believe they listened? Oh, yeah. So we, I think the first one was uh, all of the uh, the Northern Europeans, like the, the Finns, the Swedes, the Norwegians, they all wanted uh, treats with no dairy in them. You know, they wanted cookies and things like that without dairy. So that's no big deal. So we just started making stuff without dairy. And I was smart enough to realize that they're probably going to like cardamom. So we put cardamom in all those trees. They love cardamom. That's the spice up there. That worked. And then, you know, then Team Canada. Then I meet Team Canada. Like, holy cow, guys. Anything you need for you guys? What can I do? Anything? <laughs> One of the guys on the team called his grandmother to get her lasagna recipe. <laughs> it gets to me. I'm going to make a lasagna for the team. Next thing you know, I'm on the phone to a Tobacco talking to grandma. And after they get her back up off the floor, <laughs> 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 So we made the lasagna, and they loved it. They loved it. They loved it. And then I meet Team Prince Edward Island. You know, I'm from Canada, the smallest province. You know, we're 150,000 people out east to the east of Maine there. It's all the Canadians in the room now. And we're not a very big place. We're 150,000 people. We welcome 1.5 million tourists every year. We had one person on our Olympic team. <laughs> one person on the national team. She's a bobsled. Bobsled, uh, the back, the co-pilot, co uh, Heather Boyd. And so she and her driver came to me, and I'm like, oh, Heather. Like, I, I knew Heather, met her before. Like, anything you need, Heather, anything at all. Like, come on, anything. Just let us know. We're here. We're, we got a team. We want you to do anything. She looks at me. She says, Michael, gee whiz, one night. Oh, God, I would just love a 7-Eleven cream soda slurpee. <laughs> oh, what do I do? Ladies and gentlemen, the Olympic Village is the most secure place on the planet. Okay, we got RCMP blitz.
blimps, all right, surveillance. We've got RCMP snipers up in the mountains around the village, and we know they're there because they come down every day at one o'clock for lunch. We want to right down. So, and 7-Eleven is not an Olympic sponsor. You don't just walk through the door with 7-Eleven. That's not how it works. We had to go through multiple layers of security, and if it was a product that was not a sponsor, for instance, FedEx sponsored the games, not a Purolator. So try to get a Purolator package in. You can't, you can't. 7-Eleven, no go. So right away, I had to let like three different plans going on for this thing. I got my pastry chef trying to figure out what is a cream soda Slurpee. And I've got this other stinky guy that works for me. You go get a cream soda Slurpee, bring it in your water bottle. <laughs> Minnesota Slurpee. <laughs> she takes one sip, throws it in the garbage, and says, okay, that worked, but what I really, really want, what I really want, what we have is a tradition, the night before we ride, we have a steak dinner. I'm like, steak dinner? We got steak dinner. So next so we got this covered. So we have PEI potatoes, Alberta beef, like we put a steak dinner together for, for Kaylee and for, and they ran the first day, and we did it again the second night, they ran the second day. Does anybody remember how they did? Gold medal, baby! <laughs> I'm just saying. I'm not taking credit. But you know this, there's always a chef there in the background somewhere. So I guess the point of all this, though, is I tell you this story. There's so much that I could share with you about the Olympics. So much. Greatest professional challenge of my life. But afterwards, when I looked back, and I looked at the success of it all, and the, uh, the IOC, formally notified us that we had scored the highest ever food service ratings in the history of the modern Olympic Games in Whistler. So we, that was us, that was an excellent, we did that. And that felt really good. And I can look down and I can see with that 2020 vision that really what made it work was that I just doubled down. I just refused to give up. I held on to my core values. Leading five people, leading 10 people, leading 100 people, it's not that different. It's not that different. Please don't put a thousand people in front of me. I don't know if I'm ready for that, but it worked. It worked. And understanding that we're about guests and understanding that we have to be reactive, proactive to their needs, all of those things, all of those things are just part of who I am. All of those things worked for us there at that massive scale. So, you know, next time we're moving on to something, some big project, put it all in perspective. You know, stay true to yourself. A lot of those values that got you there in the first place, you don't feel like you have to compromise just because it's different or bigger. So, you know, keep it in perspective. I was here at 8.30 in this room, thinking about what I was going to talk about. You know, looking out that window right there, watching three guys on the roof of the building next door get their ropes ready to go over the edge of the building to wash the windows. Keep it in perspective, folks. We're not washing windows and buildings here. You know, we could, things could be a little more difficult. I mean, we're serving people. We're serving guests. We're making them happy. We're creating opportunities for them. It is pretty straightforward. It is hospitality. I and mean, when we hold on to those values, we're good. Okay, how am I doing here? It feels like time to wrap it up, huh? I want to get you guys like, yeah. Okay, so. Um, oh yeah, make mistakes. Oh my God, make mistakes. <laughs> Why are we so risk averse? Why are we so scared of mistakes? I mean, you all know people you work with who will never admit they made a mistake. And worse yet, they will paralyze you and your organization because they're so busy defending the fuck up that they can't move on. They can't move on. They're stuck yesterday. Yeah. Meanwhile, I've already seen the mistake, acknowledged it, and I'm on. Moving on. Like, if you are so stuck in yourself that you've got to take all that personally, you got to defend it in the first place, it paralyzes you. You will never be productive. You're never going to be a true leader. You're never going to move things forward. You're just not. You know what I'm talking about. You know these people. Make mistakes. And that is my point. Like, create a culture where it's okay to make mistakes, where mistakes are expected. They're going to happen no matter what. So frame the story differently. I encourage my team, make mistakes. Try it. What's the worst that could happen? It's wrong, so we'll try it differently tomorrow. What's the big deal? I'm not oversimplifying. I'm not. We are very process-oriented as an industry, and we should be. 
We're making food. We're serving food to people. We can make people sick. We should be process oriented. <laughs> At the same time, we should not be so process oriented that we get all bound up in systems and then we miss the opportunity to be in the moment and try new things. And you're like, uh, uh, you've all heard this. You've all sat in these big meetings with the visioning session and the guy from you know four levels above you talking about the new corporate system, this, that, and the other. It's all hooey. You know, <laughs> make mistakes, create a culture that expects and celebrates mistakes, and watch what happens. My team comes to me regularly, relentlessly, constantly with ideas over and over and over again, day after day after day, because they know <clears throat> They're going to be accepted and heard and received. And we're so far past the startup that we're into the sweet spot now where those ideas work. They're engaged. They're on the front lines. They're thinking about our guests. I want that. You want that. And I know it's because they know. And I say it all the time. I make mistakes constantly. Screw things up regularly. Sleep on my couch constantly. Okay? I'm just saying. You know, just because I'm on TV doesn't mean I'm perfect. No way, no way. You know, and I, I want my team to know this, and I know it's one of the core values embedded in our team. They make those mistakes. Just do it. Just do it. Celebrate them. Everybody got it? Yes. Okay. Where does that leave us? Well, I guess to sum all this up, I started by sharing with you uh, an honor, a so-called honor. New degree in Niagara College. One of the most interesting awards I think I've ever gotten, and there's been a lot of them. And the idea that all of us, in essence, we have within us the knowledge, the ability, the passion, the flair, the momentum. We have all those things that so often we have to just give ourselves permission. You know, it's like how many times have you sat in a room like this and just nodded your head because everything everybody's saying. But things you already know, things you already understand. So what's different? What's holding you back? What stops you from taking these things and doing something with it? I don't know, to be honest. That's on you. But I guess what I'm trying to do is remind you that moving forward is never this gigantic, complicated, over-the-top thing. We make it more complicated than it needs to be. There's basic, underlying core values that make business so much easier. You know, one thing that you've heard me say repeatedly, over and over, the word guest is so powerful. My business has guests. We don't have customers. We have guests. It bugs me when I hear Air Canada announce customers come do this, customers come. We're guests. We're guests. We're guests. It matters. Little things like that matter. So as I sum it up, I want you to understand that I'm not standing here as some kind of wild business guru. All I have is school of hard knocks. All I have is an ability to celebrate mistakes, see mistakes, learn a thing or two from them. I've got an ability to put that mantle of leadership on, and lead a team of people at BG. All of those things are very basic though. So maybe we should stop looking for some big complicated over the top vision in the sky that's going to move us forward. The, the real stuff is right there in front of you. It's with you already. Just look back. Figure out what's making you who you are, and then look forward. And when the day comes that you get a real reward, something big, celebrate. So let me tell you about the best award I think I've ever gotten in my life. And it wasn't that Niagara College. So not that long later, I'm back here in Toronto, and I've been asked to come and present on stage at the Delicious Food Show. It's one of these big consumer shows. You've all been to them. Foodies everywhere, thousands and thousands of people, booths, every food thing in Toronto there. And a big stage with a kitchen set, and Martha Stewart on stage. Uh, and me, the next day, on the same stage. She enters one day, I enter the next, whatever. But I gotta go up a day early because I gotta sign cookbooks. A lot of cookbooks, 700 cookbooks I gotta sign. So I go up a day early, I'm behind the stage, Martha's team is getting ready to put her on the stage. My show's tomorrow. I'm signing the cookbooks. I'm going to get these cookbooks done. 700 cookbooks. By the way, it's not the wrist. It's here. This is where you feel it. This is where you feel This is where you feel it. Things they don't teach in cooking school. Right? So I'm signing 700 books. And while I'm signing all those books, I 
I gradually become aware of these two guys in the room. The, the, this is like the behind the stage green room, they call it, which is never green. <laughs> and there we are. And these guys are like head to toe dressed in black. Armand, <laughs> head to toe. Glasses, the socks, probably everything, head to toe. Mm -hmm. And it turns out they're Martha Stewart's bodyguards. <laughs> and they're guarding the Martha Stewart Escalade out the back alley, because Martha Stewart Escalade's got to get her back to the Martha Stewart plane. Okay. <laughs> 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 yeah, they're working for her, we're just hanging out, signing books, chatting, it's all good, whatever. And then I get done, and it's time to go watch the show. Now, I'm not the kind of guy that pulls strings. That's not what I do, you know? That day, though, man, I pulled that big freaking roll. Pull that shit. Let's go. Martha Stewart. I don't know about where you live. I live in Eastern PEI. Martha Stewart is never coming to the Eastern Prince Edward Island <laughs> King's Exhibition. Like, it ain't going to happen. So, I, like, I never get to see these people, ever. They're always the day after, the day before, and I got to get home. I got kids, whatever. This day, I'm watching Martha Stewart. We get front row center seats. So, my team and I, we walk out, the lights are down quietly, and she's on stage with her team, just finishing up, just getting ready to start her show. We go to sit down, of course, you know, that's not how it rolls, right? I'm in Toronto, there's a thousand booties in the room, and there's Michael Smith in the front of the room. So now it's autographs and pictures, and that's all good, it's all good, until I get the, the Martha Stewart stink eye. <laughs> She has no idea who I am. She has no idea. You know, my shows have never been on in the States. Everywhere in the world but the States. I don't care. Whatever. So I sit down. Quiet. All right. And we watched the show. And it was amazing. 45 minutes. She pulled off five cakes in 45 minutes. She smiled three times. It was awesome. I can't say that. Serious. And then comes off the stage, right out the side door. And with the Martha Stewart bodyguards for the Martha Stewart Escalade, because they got to get to the airport to the Martha Stewart jet, because they're flying right back to Manhattan for the Martha Stewart party that night. <laughs> so there go. She's walking out that back door. So she walks by the table with all the cookbooks. She stops, picks one up, pages through it, tucks it under her arm, grabs another one, and walks out the back door with two of my cookbooks, ladies and gentlemen. The biggest this morning. Enjoy the rest of the day. I'm looking forward to the copper skillet competition. Yeah. My, my blue's on. We chefs don't wear whites much anymore. So yeah. blue's today. We've got a, a blue ribbon panel of judges. We're really looking forward to seeing what the teams have come up with from around the world. So thanks. Nice to have you all here in Toronto. And thanks for listening to me today. Yeah.